The content herein is for informational purposes only, not intended as medical advice, diagnosis or treatment, and is not to be substituted for direct advice from your doctor. Welcome to LymphCast, the gathering place for physicians, healthcare experts, and special guests. We dive into the world of lymphedema, venous disease, and other related disorders, exploring their impact on your daily life. So settle in, unwind, and join us as we uncover everything you need to know about lymphedema and related conditions on our engaging show LymphCast. Today's LymphCast program is proudly sponsored by Vita Support MD, the makers of Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000. These MPFF-based nutraceuticals are backed by science and recommended by doctors specializing in venous and lymphatic disorders. Visit VitaSupportMD.com to learn more. Well, greetings and welcome to our LymphCast show, episode 37. You can find us on any podcast platform under the sun, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. You can catch us on YouTube. And please check out our website, lymphcastnetwork.com. And if you have any questions for the doctors, please email them to hello at lymphcastnetwork.com. Let's go ahead and meet our panel. And then we will kick off the show tonight uh, from Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavitsky. Hello, Dr. Glavitsky. How are you? Very well. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And welcome to this 37th LymphCast. All right. We'll bring you back in just a moment to uh, welcome our special guest. But let's go to California and welcome Dr. Emily Eicher. Hello, Dr. Eicher. How are you? Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. And we are looking forward to our fantastic podcast. All right. Thank you for being here. And the gentleman who started this uh, show, he's also the founder and owner of Vita Support MD. They make Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from New Jersey. Physician, surgeon, Dr. John A. Chuback. Hello, Dr. Chuback. How are you? Hi, Paul. Doing well. Looking forward to it. All right. It's going to be a great show. We'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Glavitsky, bring in our special guest, and off we go. It is an exceptional pleasure to welcome Dr. Kathleen Oshford, who is a Chief of Surgery in Samaritan Hospital in Troy, New York. Uh, she is also Professor of Surgery as, at uh, Albany Medical Center in Albany. Uh, Kathleen Oshford is a board certified vascular surgeon uh, her practice is includes comprehensive vascular services and uh, veins, uh, specifically vein disease uh, practice. Uh, her uh, center offers uh, different treatments such as sclerotherapy, phlebectomy, endovenous therapy, and deep venous pathology diagnosis and treatment. And she is also um, a, a very good expert in wound and uh, wound care uh, center. She is a member of St. Peter's Vascular Associate, uh, and she has also a very uh, special, specific interest in women vascular diseases, such as pelvic congestion syndrome, and healthcare advocacy. Uh, Dr. Oshvat is uh, a fellow of the American College of Surgery. She is currently a president-elect of the Eastern Vascular Society and serves as a membership council chair on the American Venus Forum Executive Board. And she serves also as secretary on the board of directors of Intersocietal Accreditation Commission. Ooh, that's a long list of the uh, interest and, uh, and practice uh, that you are involved, Kathleen. Uh, I would add in the end that you are our dear friend and uh, particularly because we have both a Hungarian connections, uh, I think there is no secret uh, looking at your name. And uh, uh, we have a lot of common projects together. So with this, I let you uh, introduce yourself also. 
Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege to be with all of you tonight. And Monica, I, I really appreciate your inviting me and we've gotten to know each other well over the years and, and it's been great. And yes, we do have a Hungarian connection. <laughs> thank you for that kind introduction as well. You're welcome. So, should we start our with, uh, our conversation around the uh, the uh, Venezuelan? I will maybe start with that uh, pelvic congestion syndrome and all the issues that uh, that uh, a lot of women specifically have uh, with venous pathology, which is hidden and not that easy to treat as varicose veins. Can you explain how do you proceed or how do you um, uh, do patient know how to find you specifically? Because it's not very frequent to to uh, to have a uh, uh, vascular surgeon taking care of it. Thank you. Yeah. So I really enjoy this patient population. Um, what I learned over the years is that most of these patients uh really flounder in the community for a long time with all kinds of symptomatology um and they're made to feel like you know they are that this is normal to feel some of the things that they're feeling so the patients will present with complaints of uh pain during or right after intercourse bloating uh heaviness pelvic pains and sometimes these patients um, we'll also have uh, complaints in their legs as well of heaviness and that type of thing. But a lot of patients that come to me have come to me through word of mouth. Um, and because, again, it's, it's not something that a lot of the internal medicine folks or the, even the GYN folks, it's taken them a while to kind of come around. And then all of a sudden now, it's like the floodgates open because the GYNs are starting to send me their patients. Um, which is relatively new. Um, so I think they're starting to see patients that we've treated who have then improved. And a lot of the patients who have this problem are also relatively young. And so they're really good on, about getting on the internet and asking questions. And then they come to the office with, with a whole stack of questions. So that's sort of and then again, over the years, uh, what has happened is that I've gotten much more comfortable asking pointed questions. So when patients started showing up to my office who had varicose veins of their legs in weird anatomic distributions, for example, we've learned now and we now know that some of that can be from pelvic disease. So I got a little better over the years at asking pa patients these direct questions. So it's funny you ask, because I was in the angio suite all day today and out of my eight cases, Three of them were were venous deep vein uh, patients who had uh, these these issues. Wow! So uh, is that frequent to to have the intervention uh, on uh, in in this type of patients, or uh, do you prefer rather conservative treatment? How do you manage them? So generally, what I do initially when I have a patient who comes in and, and has these complaints, we usually get a CAT scan to, or an MR scan to rule out any other pelvic pathology um, because uh, you know, people can have other issues as well that need to be potentially addressed. A lot of things, uh, you know, other things can cause pelvic pain. So I really want them to be worked up by a gynecologist to make sure that there's nothing else going on because other pathologies that cause pelvic pain are more common than this um, in the real world. In my world, my world is a little different than the real world. But when, um, when these patients uh, first come, I usually do a diagnostic venogram, which is basically where we look at the, the pelvic veins, the gonadal vein, um, and we, we take pictures and I tell my patients that I'm not going to intervene. I'm not going to do any procedure other than just the pictures. And we also use intravascular ultrasound to take a look at the, at the iliac veins as well. Once that's done, they come back to my office and then we go over everything because not everybody wants to have coils or stents for the rest of their life. 
And so I think it's important to have that discussion because once those goes in, th- those go in, you know, we get, we don't take them out usually. But I've learned from a very special lady that MPFF is a good thing. And so I've started recommending MPFF to my patients. And um, I've had a few over the past few months that have come back and have said, you know what, I'm good. So thank you for that. Teaching. Wonderful. Wonderful. We are happy for your patients. (laughs) I'm sure they are too. (laughs) You know, that's, a, that's a very interesting point, and I'm very happy to hear that also. <clears throat> I wanted to ask Monica, is there any data? This is really interesting, first time it's come up in the program. We know that um, in hemorrhoidal patients especially, the data has shown that higher doses and multiple doses in a day have been um, more effective and are routinely used in highly symptomatic hemorrhoid patients for MPFF, up to basically three grams a day has been looked at, a thousand milligrams TID, for example. And because the hemorrhoidal plexus um, could be considered more of a pelvic kind of source and, and anatomical distribution, Monica, I wonder if in the pelvic congestion syndrome patients, if consideration of two to three grams per day might be uh, warranted in patients who didn't necessarily respond to a thousand milligrams initially. So uh, they, uh, we have a couple of uh, studies, and one part of uh, them was with one thousand, and there is one study that is comparing the uh, one thousand and two thousand, and found slightly better efficacy, but I think still. Uh, that needs to be confirmed. I don't see any problem by uh, giving 2,000 because I know that the efficacy of this treatment is related to the dose. And so more you have, better it is, of course, reasonably, because nobody wants to uh, overflow uh, with the uh, flavonoids uh, as good as they may might be, but certainly um, in in this particular case, and and certainly in the uh, patient with the uh, uh, bigger body mass, I would really uh, uh, advise to have a higher dosage. Interesting. I thought you might say that. I yes. had quite a few patients where uh, they had May Turner syndrome, left lower extremity uh, swelling, not knowing what was going on, and combined with pelvic congestion syndrome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they, quite- they are, that, that's uh, actually that's not surprising because very, very frequently there is an issue with the uh, deep vein exactly. yes. system. So uh, that's why everybody is so cautious uh, in this particular uh, malformation, uh, I'm just had so so she sent me a text message, and and I'm just advising her to get out and in back. Okay, so that should work. Yeah, I well, what I would say, I think I think it'd be good to open up this discussion. I think that this is a really really important area of discussion, and I think. In terms of, um, as you said, Monica, opening the show, in terms of women's advocacy, I think this is an important discussion. And I think that Dr. Osvath touched on that. This is an area I'm very sensitive to because my father was an obstetrician and gynecologist. And I've been doing veins now um, about 15 years exclusively after I stopped doing cardiac surgery. And I have to tell you that it's exceedingly rare in my practice that I hear these complaints. And so something that Dr. Osvath said resonates with me, which is she has gotten more comfortable and more pointed in asking these specific questions, which I think is extremely important in the clinical examination and the history taking, because many people understandably so, many patients may feel uncomfortable discussing or revealing this. Um, 
and there may be a sense of embarrassment, shame, et cetera, associated with it. And so I think that the first thing I I do ask in my history always about um, any pain associated with sexual activity, but essentially everybody denies it. And But I don't go into some of the more detailed clinical descriptions that Kathleen was describing about postcoital um, discomfort, pain, bloating, other things. And I think that's probably something I should add to my to my history taking to bring those things out. And I can only <clears throat> imagine the number of women who are being worked up for things like, let's say, endometriosis and having, you know, laparoscopy and things to look for endometriosis, which is negative. And then often those patients, then that's kind of the end of the road for them. So I'm very sensitive to that subject because I can remember, you know, my father talking a lot about endo endometriosis when he was chief of the department many years ago here in New Jersey. And he was very concerned about the overutilization of laparoscopy for making the diagnosis of endometriosis. Uh, you know, he used to euphemistically call it uh, painoscopy, you know, where you're looking for pain. And then so often you don't find mm -hmm. anything. And he was concerned that way, far too much laparoscopy was being done um, with you know, because they would have tissue committee meetings and things like that, and there was no tissue to review. And then indications meetings and things like that. So it's a very, very important subject. And I think one of the first things that's coming out of tonight's podcast is, if you are a woman, um, and we can discuss men also, but let's start with women. If you are a woman, because I noticed earlier, Dr. Osvath very carefully used the terminology gonadal vein as opposed to ovarian vein, I'm sure that wasn't an accident. If you are a woman suffering from or experiencing pelvic discomfort, pelvic pain, uh, especially after or during sexual activity, bloating in the pelvic area, et cetera, then you should really talk to your gynecologist about that first, obviously, and be persistent about it and be open about it and don't be ashamed to talk about it. Uh, don't be fearful to talk about it. That's what we physicians are here for, is to bring relief to people who are suffering. And you don't have to be suffering terribly. You don't have to be in excruciating pain to, to tell your doctor what's going on and how you're feeling. And then finally, if you don't find any answers there, perhaps look for a vein specialist, and especially one who is um, presenting themselves as a pelvic congest congestion syndrome expert like Dr. Osvath and bring your complaints there because the worst thing in the world as a, as a physician and a healthcare practitioner of any kind is to have people with treatable disease who go through life suffering needlessly. So that's, that's why I love this program so much. I think it's so important to bring out these points. So that's, that's made tonight's show totally worth it to me. Kathleen, do you have any response to any of that? Yeah. I mean, what I've noticed over the years is that there are so many women suffering out there and, and they've tried to express that and have been told that that's normal. It's not normal. Yes. So I, I think, again, for me, sometimes these patients are the ones that come back so happy to have been treated because they feel like they can get back to their normal lives. I've There's one in particular that comes to mind that I treated recently who really suffered a lot and was partially treated and told that, you know, she's fine and she actually got worse because they only partially treated her. So when she came to me, um, you know, basically I started over, did new tests, and I found another issue and it was her iliac vein that was involved and so we placed a stent and that relieved the problem because basically they had treated the gonadal vein or um but then they they didn't treat the other half or the other part to all this and this was a woman who was young otherwise healthy had a couple of kids you know got to a point where she was having so much discomfort that it was hard for her to play with her children and then after, and this was last Thanksgiving, actually, and I, I just saw her in follow-up. 
Um, and I was supposed to be off and the family was coming from a distance to have her treated. And I came in on my day off and I treated her and literally both she and her husband were so grateful. And it, it made my, like, it, I'll never forget that. Like, because she was able to get back to her life. So, yeah. you know, and, and, and that's what, that's what matters. And that's what brings me to work every day. Well, I congratulate you on that case, and I'm going to tell you specifically why from one surgeon to another. Frequently in my practice, I see patients who have been treated elsewhere, and they come to me at some point later, sometimes relatively immediately, and sometimes months and even years later, because they have persistent symptoms. And typically, um, I'm sure as Dr. Osvath knows, typically, um, fortunately, the the problem is not that anything had been done wrong per se, but the patient has been uh, either moderately or even grossly undertreated. There's a lot more venous disease to take care of. And many people have gotten into this field learning how to do some of the basics you know, a straightforward endovenous ablation of a great saphenous vein or something like that. And the patient comes to me loaded with varicose veins and other um, major axial veins that need to be treated and so on and so forth. And then we go ahead and treat them and they get progressively better and, and they're very happy and I'm very happy and so forth. What's a little different in this case that um, Kathleen is referring to why I give her so much credit for her courage is that it's a little bit different because it sounds like that patient after the first uh, gonadal vein ablation or coiling actually got significantly worse. And when something like that happens, it's easy for a surgeon to become skittish and to become um, anxious about taking on that patient because here's somebody else's patient who did sort of what appears to be half a job but it seems like that half a job may have been a reasonable thing to do. And nevertheless, she became symptomatically worse. So that's concerning. Hey, you know, listen, if I take on this patient who somebody else already began working with is not only not doing better, but is doing worse. And I do stage B and the person gets even worse. You know, the Hippocratic Oath rule number one is do no harm. So it's easy in that area, in, in a clinical scenario like that, to kind of shy away from it and walk away from it. So I give you tremendous credit for having the courage to take it on and to proceed. Vein Formula 1000 and Lymphatic Formula 1000 from Vita Support MD are backed by science and sold in doctor's offices. If you're a physician who may be interested in prescribing or selling these excellent nutraceuticals, please call 862-246-7877 to speak to a representative today. One of the things about that particular case that really taught me a lot and, you know, uh, was the fact that she was actually originally referred to one of the interventional radiologists who actually trained me years ago, like 25 years ago. And he referred her to me based on another finding on the CAT scan saying that I needed to do a surgical procedure on her. It happened to be a, you know, nutcracker or renal vein. And I, I have a lot of gray hair, you know, recently I had it dyed, so you can't see it. But um, the, the bottom line is uh, what I've learned over the years is even though this mentor of mine sent the patient to me for something different, what I've learned is we start over, pretend like the patient's never been seen by anybody. And when I start fresh, I do new pictures. I really go, try to figure out what the anatomy is because that anatomy can be very complicated. And actually her renal vein or, you know, was fine. It did not need surgery. She had a significant um, obstruction of her left iliac vein, which is the outflow or the egress for the blood to flow, um, especially if the gonadal vein has been taken out of commission, which it had been done and it was done beautifully. Um, and so once we fixed that, she was better. But, you know, again, I think that as physicians, we have to work together and figure out what's best for the patient. And what, what I'm very blessed because in my area, you know, there, th this uh, mentor of mine, we share a lot of patients even though we're in different specialties. And I think that really 
helps and it, it makes all the difference. People, Paul, do you understand everything? I, I'm sorry. So far, I do. Yeah, we're, we're keeping up with it. And yeah. every time we do a show, when the two or three of you uh, physicians, in this case four, uh, begin to talk, it's almost like you're discovering new information too, which excites me as a non-physician because I'm getting it all new. And sometimes you're learning something new as well, which is something I mentioned in an episode or two ago. You're always in that learning mode. And I think that's absolutely great. Wonderful. I just want to point out, Dr. Kathleen, congratulations on your fantastic work. I wish that you would be closer to Santa Monica. I see lymphatic disorders in patients with primary lymphedema or primary lymphedema with May Turner uh, have the combination of the pelvic congestion syndrome. And I remember one young lady and she was in early 30s and her symptom was, I cannot lie on my left side because it hurts and it feels fuller. And that was the initiation of the discovery of pelvic congestion syndrome in addition to lymphatic problems. So uh, the history, as you pointed out, is very important for these patients and it doesn't have to start with just with uh, sexual problems. Simple lying on the side, which gives you the initial symptoms. And and then, of course, we worked her up. And yes, she had not only lymphatic problems, but also pelvic congestion syndrome. And now we are lucky to have the MPFF so we can treat these patients. Absolutely. And I think you bring up a very interesting point. And that is, is that if the venous system is not working properly, it will overwhelm the lymphatic system. Yes. And and I think that that, you know, that's one of those things that's extremely important to think about when we see these patients. And when we when we meet these patients and I now will ask them, you know, if they're coming to me for pelvic, uh, primarily pelvic issues, I always ask about their legs and I always look at their legs and that, you know, and I'll ask, you know, is one leg more swollen than the other? And it's like a light bulb goes off and they'll look at me and go, how did you know? (laughs) Well, I'm learning too. Like that's, what's really exciting about what we do. I mean, I, I tell people, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been having any of these discussions because we really, A, didn't have the language. We didn't have the classification systems to teach us how to think about the pathology. And here we are now. So we're just at the very cusp of really learning the best ways to treat patients. Yeah, agreed. I'm going to bring out a couple of things picking up on the conversation. First, to Paul's point, Paul, very good observation. And Paul was an educator his whole life and attended many, many educational seminars as a principal and so forth. We physicians are not perfect creatures either. And as you as you point out again and again, we're in a constant state of learning. And a huge part of that learning process is this collegiality that we have in our profession or should have in yeah. ideal circumstances. <laughs> Unfortunately, in many cases, it becomes too uh, adversarial and competitive and we don't have these wonderful opportunities to share our thoughts and share our ideas. And so that's why we go to medical conferences and seminars is to be around one another and share experience. Um, typically, people at our level are not starting from the basics anymore. We're, we're kind of flying at a high level and talking about the more challenging issues. So great observation. And I want our listeners to know that we're here to teach you and educate you, but as I say many times, we're we're learning right along with you, and having these conversations makes us all better at we do, what we do so that we can do a better job taking care of you and taking care of one another, because as one of my professors used to say, eventually the doctor needs the doctor. So we want to make sure all the doctors are as good as they can be because we're all going to need one one day too. Um so the second point was I wanted to pick up on this excellent point that Emily brought out, because in my first statement about taking a good history and physical, I was really focused on the sexual and post-coital, post-sexual symptomatology. And Emily comes back to point out something very, very important. 
don't only focus on sexual related pelvic pain and post sexual related pelvic pain, other positions, other activities, non activities, just standing, et cetera, may elicit these same symptoms in a patient who, for whatever reason, does not have sexual or post sexual symptoms. So it can be very complex, the anatomy as and, and the physiology. And for our listeners, meaning how the blood flows in that particular patient, what their particular anatomy uh, does to their circulation and how they how they experience symptoms. So great point, Emily, in bringing out that. Um, and then going back also to what Dr. Osvath said earlier, which is a very important thing she that she sort of touched on, but I under I, I think I understood her message, and she'll correct me if I'm wrong, which is I always tell my patients, I want to treat you, I don't want to treat an ultrasound. I want to treat you, I don't want to treat an MRV or a CAT scan, etc. The testing is there to give us information, but not to dictate how a good physician and surgeon behaves, functions, and what treatment they elicit. So when Dr. Osvath refers to this issue of coils being placed in the pelvic veins, this is a big decision for a patient because, as she said, this is a permanent circumstance. These little coils that we won't get into the technicality of how that's all done tonight, but uh, suffice it to say, small little coil-shaped pieces of very high-tech metal um, get left in these veins to close them down, sometimes in combination with injection of a medication, foam medication, et cetera. But it's a it's a quite involved procedure. It's for someone with tremendous experience and training. It's not for um, every physician and surgeon to be doing. And that procedure has to be done with great discretion. Not everybody who has findings on a, on a venogram or intravascular ultrasound or um, magnetic resonance image or CAT scan needs or should have these procedures done. And a big part of that, and I know this is, and this will segue hopefully to the next subject, um, has to do with a good relationship between the patient and the physician, the patient and the surgeon, the patient and the interventional radiologist, et cetera, whoever it is taking care of you, gynecologist, whomever. There has to be a good relationship and a discussion, a conversation, communication between the patient and the doctor, and not that the doctor simply orders a procedure on the patient the way one would order um, a pair of shoes from Zappos today. And that, unfortunately, without being glib about it, that kind of thing happens far too frequently. And patients can later regret that. And doctors can re later regret that. But these are big decisions. And it takes, a, again, I give Dr. Osvath a tremendous amount of credit for taking on these cases because there's a lot of education that needs to go on between the physician and the patient a lot of understanding of complex issues. And in the end, it's a big decision. And generally speaking, I would say, should only really go forward when there are really significant issues that are getting in the way of one's ability to really enjoy life and have a normal life. And, I, and I'll just end it with this, you know, in memory of my old friend and colleague, Dr. Mel Rosenblatt, who was in Connecticut for many years, where I used to send my congestive uh, congestion, uh, pelvic congestion patients. I sent Mel maybe four or five patients over the years before, unfortunately, his early passing. And to his credit, with all of his skills and everything else, all of those patients he sent back to me saying, I don't think an intervention is warranted. And just treat everything below the inguinal ligament, treat the superficial veins. Let's see how she does. And, you know, if things don't get better, then we can always reconsider it. And and in each case, that turned out to be just fine. We 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 treated the disease in the legs and the patients were satisfied, felt felt significantly better, and Mel didn't have to intervene. Unfortunately, what I'm starting to see and observe in our profession is that people like that and people like Dr. Osvath are becoming, I'm afraid, maybe more of the exception than the rule. And many people are going 
willy-nilly into these procedures without really considering it. So after that long sort of discussion, Kathleen, please. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, there's a couple of issues. First of all, you're 100% correct. Um, there are there are physicians out there who are maybe good at one aspect or another, so that's what they do. The problem in these patients, they tend to be complicated. So one thing may not, quote, fix everything. Mm-hmm. Um, with that said, not everything needs to be fixed, right? I mean, that is the bottom line. So that discussion must happen. Um, I've had patients where I've found all kinds of things and I told them what I found and they were like, you know what, I really like you, but I don't want to hang out with you in a uh, cath lab. You know, uh, I'm good the way I am. And I'm like, that's great. You know, (laughs) come back if you need me, you know where I am. Um, There's another issue that uh, that I think is real when it comes to pelvic venous disease, especially um, a lot of the insurance companies call it experimental and will not cover it. So the flip side that I see is that I have some patients who really could benefit from some, from something being done and they can't because their insurance company that doesn't cover it. So one of the problems I see is that I have to you know try to fight that and that's difficult at times. Um, so patients who really do need the care and really wanna feel better and would like to go through with things, we have to go to bat for them and you know do what we what we can to speak to medical directors and insurance companies or whatever that it may be with superficial venous uh disease it things have been um sort of gold standards such as uh, thermal ablation and whatnot that first started off as being experimental too but now it's the gold standard now that's covered if the patient has you know, uh, symptomatology that meets certain criteria and whatnot. Um, And we've learned a lot with that as well. From the time that I started doing this 25 years ago to today, we've learned a lot. In other words, patients with ulcers, that type of thing really benefit if they're treated, if they have superficial uh, disease and so on. So, you know, one of the um, problems I've noticed, especially with with uh, advocacy and um, with the healthcare issues, uh, you started to bring up something about men. Men also have gonadal vein reflux and have uh, visible varicoceles. That gets covered because it's visible. In women, it's all tucked away and nobody can see it from the outside. So it's not covered. Those are the kinds of disparities that I that really I feel strongly about and that we have to work on as a medical group, if you will. I don't know. I'll stop there if one of you comment. It's certainly, you know, the uh, the issue of the uh, coverage of the uh, this treatment and probably also is the globally speaking, the issue of the new technologies and the learning curve from yes. both sides by physician and by the insurances, by whole system, health system. I, I think certainly, you know, like the, you have something uh, relatively new coming, like the concept of the uh, uh, treatment for uh, pelvic congestion syndrome or any anything new technology for varicose veins. And you have to literally fight to um, to introduce this in the real life. As you all may know, uh, Dr. Glavitsky is one of the lead authors on some of the Venus guidelines that, that have been published and some just recently published. And one of the things that, you know, uh, we grapple with and that we really have to we have to find the evidence, right? So we have to go through the literature and really find all the papers that support one treatment over another. And the problem, as you point out, with new technology, the research hasn't caught up yet. So what are we going to tell our patients? Like, we think it's going to work, but there's not enough research yet. The research hasn't been done. So, and these are the things that, that you know, we, we work very hard in trying to figure out so we can make the best recommendation to our patients. That's, that's a very difficult balance, certainly. I, I can imagine in practice how it is. 
Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, tell me also, you know, like uh, because we were touching a little bit about the all uh, relationship issue and uh, uh, certainly not only with patients, uh, but also with the uh, other uh, specialists. And I think you are pretty good with that. How do you manage? I'm very blessed. Uh, I, I work in an area where I feel like we've, we have good relationships uh, with one another in the various specialties that treat this, uh, these diseases and symptomatologies and whatnot. Um, you know, I, I think I'm very lucky. Um, and I personally am a people person. I, I liked working with my colleagues. So when I have questions, I'm the first to say, I don't know, do you, would you mind helping me? What are your thoughts? And vice versa is what I found. So, you know, I, I, I work very well with my other colleagues who are in different specialties who do treat these problems. And then I, I don't know, it seems to work well. And I'm lucky again, because there are not a lot of uh, some of these stand up places that I think Dr. Chubek was referring to where um, sometimes a lot of procedures get done. Um, we don't we don't have that in our area so much. Well, that indeed you are lucky. Consider yourself fortunate. <laughs> I know. I think it's coming. It's a matter of time. And it is what it is. What I found, you know, at least over the years here, when somebody tried to do something that they weren't so good at, they would send patients my way when there were complications or questions. And I always try to look at it as, you know, that's okay. They tried, they failed. I'm going to do my best. And if, if I set up a collegial discussion with them, they just send more patients my way. And, you know, it, it, it seemed, it worked for me over the years here. And those people then like retired or went elsewhere or whatever <laughs> over time. Yeah, that's how it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kathleen, could you uh, tell us a little bit about the, the, the wound care organization in, in your region? Yeah. So now many years ago, a wound care center was opening in the hospital where I work at now. And, uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, um, the lead person in my group said, you know, um, we would like for you to go for training and maybe you can be a, you can work at the wound care center for a half day a week. Um, and I think it was because at that time I was just sort of early in my career. And so I was like, uh, okay. So I went for training. I came back, I started working in the wound care center. And what I learned from that patient population is that, there is so much disease out there, both arterial and venous, in, these, in this patient population that's literally floundering because they don't know where to go, right? So they ended up in the wound care center. I ultimately ended up run, becoming medical director of the wound care center. Those patients are the patients that initially taught me what I know about venous disease, and about uh, the importance of intervening you know, in patients who have uh, venous ulcers and those types of things. Um, so it, it was an incredible experience. Um, after a while, as, as I became busier after seven years, I, uh, I stepped down as a medical director and the new medical director was somebody who I'd worked very closely with and we're still on speed dial with one another. So we set up a situation where they can get any arterial or venous testing done through our office. If they want a consultation from us, we you know, consult. And uh, then they take care of the wounds, which is um, you know, what they do such a great job with. And it, it's been a very wonderful long-term relationship. That's wonderful. You know, that's truly, and, and I had the pleasure to meet the uh, one part of the group when I visited you in Albany, and it was really looks like a a, a um, team uh, with the uh, open mind, you know, the uh, caring about the patient, and uh, and very friendly with with your center. Definitely, and we we were so grateful that you came because I wanted them to hear what you had to say and what, you know the research you've done and uh, with MPFF because I think that that was missing. 
uh, or is still missing from a lot of these patients. Um, they're getting treatments, but not enough. So I think that after hearing you speak, they went back and they've, you know, they're, they're mulling it over, listening and starting to uh, recommend it to their patients. Wonderful. So we've yeah. learned from you. <laughs> yeah. and, there, and there's no question that the data is clear on venous leg ulcer, particularly. Yeah. And as you know, all of the major vascular societies now, SVS, AVF, AVLS, all have in the guidelines a strong recommendation for for venous leg ulcer. So, you know, in my opinion, if those patients aren't getting um, MPFF or I think MPFF, the data is the best, but any sort of phlebotonic in, in addition to their local wound care and vascular management, um, it's really inappropriate care. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but it is a strong recommendation. I think Mark Meisner, Emily, uh, Monica said it um, when we were in Miami, that it's not really something you have the, the choice in incorporating in venous leg ulcer anymore, given, given those recommendations. At Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid-based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and at Vita Support MD, we believe in creating the best bioflavonoid-based supplements to support your vitality. Bioflavonoids are found in abundance in nature and support excellent health and wellness. The demands and stresses being put on our bodies in these challenging times are unlike any we have seen before. Support your body with the flavonoids it needs to fight inflammation and oxidation. Unlike other products in the marketplace, Vita Support MD dietary supplements use micronized flavonoids for optimal absorption and effectiveness. Micronization is an advanced process which creates an ultra-fine powder easily absorbed by the body. At Vita Support MD, we are passionate about making your good health our life's work. Yeah, but so many people need to be educated. I mean, <laughs> tell me about it. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I, I was like, I literally, I heard Monica give the most beautiful talk, uh, you know, last, I think it was in May. And I literally sat there and it was almost like, you know, the light bulb went off. I'm like, what? I need to bring this back. And then, you know, speaking to other Venus specialists that who are our friends, you know, um, I asked them, I'm like, do you do this too? Like, do you, have you been offering this MPFF stuff to people? And then they confirmed like their patients are, are improving and getting better. So I was like, well, I got to, I got to bring it back to Albany and make sure that everybody is educated. And you'd be surprised at how many people were like, oh, I don't believe that. No, that can't be. And then they try it. They use it with their patients. I even bought it for myself. <laughs> I can't like, you know, recommend this if I don't try it. Let's see if it, and I really felt a difference. You know, I, my legs aren't as tired when I'm standing all day long doing vascular surgery cases for hours on end. Like I, my legs felt better. So I'm like, there's got to be something. So that's why we invited uh, Dr. Glavitsky to come and give her fabulous talk to my group. And um, even the naysayers were like, oh my God, I'm going to buy this stuff. <laughs> well, we are all the same because Emily is taking it. <laughs> I'm taking it and John <laughs> We're all taking it. Yeah. Um, well, that's wonderful. And, you know, Monica can tell you we work tirelessly. Emily can tell you we work tirelessly spreading this message. But it is antithetical to what physicians in the United States have been taught, especially because 
these products in the United States. And I and I think that this is a, this is a great fortune for people, good fortune that it's considered a dietary supplement and a natural supplement here and not a medication. Because of allopathic medical training in the United States, people, physicians just have a hard time believing something that's a supplement could actually be effective. Now, I always say that on the other side of that coin, that's a ridiculous um, preconceived notion because at the same time, we physicians know that if you have vitamin D deficiency chronically, you'll get rickets. If you have vitamin C deficiency chronically, you'll get scurvy. If you have vitamin A deficiency chronically, you'll go blind. And that those things can be prevented and treated with supplementation. So why we've become so dependent on big pharma and so forth for drugs is not a mystery, I suppose, but it, but it's but it's a sad thing to to watch. And we all know that during COVID, in the early days of COVID, when it was really quite terrifying and so forth, um, and there was no antiviral to offer and there was no vaccine to offer, the best medical centers in the world, including here in the United States, we're talking about big doses of vitamin C, big doses of vitamin D, big doses of vitamin E, et cetera, et cetera. Suddenly, everybody became a believer when they had nothing else to, to offer. So it is a, it's, a, it's a struggle, but it's a labor of love. And we all thank Monica for the amazing, amazing work that she did for more than 15 years in Paris, doing the clinical studies, the bench research, et cetera, et cetera, to provide the, the foundation for all of the data that that came that came later yeah this this is the uh, just the simple the uh, fact that you need to to back up the uh, uh, whatsoever you offer to to patient by the science you cannot offer something that it's not studies there is studied even even if this is a natural uh, supplement, you cannot change something and say, okay, that's going to be a good compound. You have to really have the background of the studies, proving the safety, proving the efficacy, and that's what we have. That's, that I think that this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the most important part. But the, the one place where it really bothers me the most, the... Um difficulty in educating people to these to these truths and to this science is in the wounded patient because wounded patients really suffer a lot and all of us who went through surgical training have spent a significant time taking care of patients with all kinds of wounds leg wounds decubitus ulcers post surgical wounds uh, dehiscence diabetic wounds and if you don't have compassion for a patient who's chronically wounded, you can't really call yourself a human being. And if you've had the great joy, it takes some maturity, I think, as a surgeon, as a physician. When you're in training, taking care of wounds is somehow seen as the, the bottom of the barrel, the, the first rung of surgical excellence and so on and so forth. But nobody wants to do. People want to pass it on to the junior person and so on and so forth. And that job rolls downhill. When you become more mature and you have a bigger um, perspective, a better perspective of the, of the landscape of what it means to be a physician and someone who is a healer, so to speak, there's, I think, no greater joy and satisfaction than seeing somebody who had a wound for three months or six months or two years or more, which is finally healed and they can expose their extremity in front of their wife, their husband, their children, go into a swimming pool. It's it's quite a wonderful feeling. And to think that so many patients who have venous leg ulcers are being undertreated by this simple supplement being excluded for their treatment out of arrogance and ignorance, it bothers me. Well, most of the time here is just the uh, lack of knowledge. It, right. It's that that's the issue, and that's the uh, the fact that uh, that wasn't available until uh, several years ago, and uh, it takes time. 
takes time. To but it, it, and I agree, but but when people yeah. reject yes. the science another, because they have a preconceived notion of of whatever it is that there's no oral supplementation for chronic venous disease, pelvic congestive syndrome, venous leg ulcer. You have to just say, please take the time to sit down and read it, evaluate it yourself. But, but, but you know, the, uh, we had the same issue with the uh, uh, the, uh, the venous surgery in, uh, in the venous leg ulcer. How many years, how many effort took to uh, to everybody to uh, to to uh, go with the uh, to come finally with with the accepted message that you need to treat the venous disease. Uh, you need to have the uh, uh, interventions uh, for patients with venous leg ulcers. You know that it took uh, like uh, like uh, in two steps uh, actually because it was first it was the SCAR trial and the uh, the uh, that was coming showing that it's less uh, recurrences with the uh, intervention and um, uh, then just recently people accepted that you, you don't have to wait you have to just uh, take care of the uh, the venous disease in patients with the uh, venous leg ulcers so it's always slow process, unfortunately. Well, and it, it's, it's a great point, Monica, that you bring out. Maybe Kathleen, Dr. Osbeth can comment. It sounds like she's had a great impact in her community, but where I am, we're still seeing lots and lots of patients with chronic venous leg ulcers somehow finally get to me and other qualified people like myself who've spent, in some cases, more than a year in a quote-unquote specialized wound care center in a hospital setting with quote unquote board certified plastic surgeons, vascular surgeons, et cetera, et cetera, general surgeons caring for these people who've not had any kind of vascular evaluation whatsoever. I mean, it's conceivable. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And um, when I first started this whole wound care thing, I realized that actually what was important was to heal the patient. If you're a wound care center, you want the patient to heal because there's so many more people that need to come through the door. Um, and I, so you're you're right. I, I think that there's there are all kinds of issues associated with this. I think the only way to really make a difference is to keep educating. And when we learn something, when I learned from Monica, I then brought it back and I made it a point to bring her to us, to teach us, because just because I say it that I learned it is wasn't enough, and so that you've got to chip away at this. And I think the other thing is that the the societies need to get good or better about um, presenting this type of work. They need to include venous disease uh, in the vascular surgery, uh, you know, meetings, which you know some do, some don't. Um, and I just think there, there's a huge lack of education. Um, and it, you got to start somewhere. And sometimes it's locally. And, and then if you're lucky, you can get it nationally. Uh, Monica mentioned earlier that um, the Eastern Vascular Society is, you know, that for me, my goal at the next annual meeting where I'll be president, I want venous disease on the forefront front. I want the trainees that come to hear about it. They're not going to go out into the, into the world practicing on complex aortic work. They need to know something about this stuff. So we're creating, um, you know, an educational session that's several hours with hands-on simulation, all of that, so that our trainees can learn something about venous disease. They need to learn it. And they're well, not let us, let us know how we can participate in that process because we would love to be a part of it. And one of the frustrations is, you know, and and Monica, I give her tremendous credit for her her um, steadfast kind of never say die approach to this over the last thirty years. And she goes one meeting at a time, one lecture at a time, one seminar at a time, one webinar at a time. And there are moments where you think, wow, this is going to be amazing. Like, for example, we were at UIP, AVLS, 
they say, okay, here's, a, you know, you look at the attendance list, you say there's going to be a thousand people here, something dramatic like that. Then I went to listen to one of Monica's talks and the way they have the meeting set up, you go there, there's 12 people in the room, six of whom are going to speak. I say, my God, like I'm envisioning it's going to get out to all 1,000 people. But the way that the meetings are set up, sometimes it's very difficult to disseminate information. And there's so many important things to be talking about, you know. So it's a challenge and we keep going along. But I give you again, Kathleen, tremendous credit for recognizing the work that Monica did and the MPFF and going the extra mile to invite her to come and speak to your to your organization um, because as you say, every, every person that we reach counts. I know that when we, when we reached Emily, it was, it was, a, it was a big thing, right, Emily? It was a big change for you in the way you practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to point out that Kathleen, I, Dr. Kathleen, I, I think all the patients are so lucky to have you for their physician because Agreed. it seems like you are uh, taking such a good care of them. And as I said, I only wish that you could come to Santa Monica from time to time. <laughs> it's warmer. <laughs> if you say it again, she might show up. She's in Albany. <laughs> <laughs> and you should come to Albany. I, yes. I mean, it's important that we share that we, you know, and now in this day and age, it's so much easier because of the platforms that we're using, such as this one where information can be shared in a much more uh, easy fashion as opposed to have to fly somewhere to go to a meeting or whatever. And even internationally, um, it's really nice to be able to get on a webinar, speak to people in other countries to hear how they're doing things. The Europeans have been using, you know, compounds like MPFF for a long, lot longer than we have. And they're so much further along. You know, Thanks, Monica. she conquered Europe. Now it's America. Yeah. America is a tough nut to crack, right? Yeah. In many ways it is. I, I, I don't know. America is uh, particular, certainly. And uh, has the has the particular uh, requirement. Has the, uh, the you know, they're, they're always good size. And... Uh, but certainly, you know, like the um, I I uh, when I compare the uh, the system here with the European system, of course, we have the free healthcare. Of course, we have the uh, some advantages. But uh, on the other side, the uh, um, the the state control over the hospitals, uh, over the healthcare, over the industry. It's tremendous. It's I I don't I I will never have enough of the explanation for people to uh, to understand that uh, you know like uh, you say here's uh, industry sponsor study and everybody understands it the American way. There is no no comparison with the European way because simply in Europe. When you are working with this study as an industry uh, uh, sponsor, you have no access to the database. This is the simplest thing. You don't, you cannot, you cannot touch it. You have the audits, you have the controls. Uh, it's, it's, it's something unbelievable. The documentation of one study takes you a, the huge storage uh, space. Well, at least at the uh, paper <laughs> version time, I don't know what is happening now, but it's it's uh, it's different world. And uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, I'm, I was happy to be a part of the research. It was fun. It was fun to work also with the uh, a lot of the uh, American scientists, like the uh, and and uh, specialists globally speaking, like Professor Bergan and uh, and uh, um, Professor Schmidtchenbein, you know, a lot of really uh, eminent people from here worked with with us. Very true. Well, congratulations. Good memories. Good memories and a lot of important work. I know you had fun, but you did very important and serious work, which is helping a lot of people today and touching a lot of lives. 
And each one of these programs helps to spread the word about great vascular surgical care, venous surgical care, lymphedema, lipedema, all of the subjects that are so near and dear to our heart, wound care. And um, I'm just proud to be a part of it and to get to meet people like Dr. Kathleen Osvath. It's been my pleasure to spend time with you, and I hope to get to know you better and um, hope to fight the good fight together. And as I said, we'd like to participate in all of those educational endeavors that you have planned. I think it's a very, very uh, ambitious and lofty goal, but I'm sure that you'll achieve those goals. And um, I think perhaps with that, Paul, we're coming, unfortunately, rapidly as always, to the end of another interesting discussion. It certainly has been. I have learned a lot. I can tell you that. So if I have, I know the audience has as well. We want to remind you, you've been listening to and or watching at the same time. Our LymphCast show, episode 37. Check out our website. Everything is there lymphcastnetwork.com. Also, if you have questions for the doctors, send them to hello at lymphcastnetwork.com. We are pretty much on every podcast platform, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everything. And we are also on YouTube, so you can watch the show in action. Before we leave, let's go around and thank our panel uh, from Arizona, Dr. Monica Glavitsky. Thank you, Dr. Glavitsky, for everything. Thank you for having me with you. It was a great pleasure. And uh, thank you again to Kathleen. Yes, I was just going to mention, if you don't mind uh, personally thanking her on behalf of all of us, that would be terrific. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, and uh, you know, like the uh, comeback, Kathleen. And I think that you should uh, establish the uh, collaboration with the uh, with uh, John Center. You know, it will be uh, really pretty, pretty good for two of you. You are not that far. Yes. New Jersey, so it's yeah. I'm going to definitely keep Dr. Osvath in mind as my as my new primary referral for pelvic congestion. Now that unfortunately our dear friend Mel is gone, um, we've been looking for somebody good, and it's about an hour and a half between us. I go through um, uh, Albany frequently to visit Lake George, and. Um, I have patients that I've treated from the Albany area. So I know that when patients have trust, they will definitely make make the trip, especially for something as important as that. So for sure, that's going to be happening. So thank you again so much. All right. Uh, also from California, Dr. Emily Eicher. Thank you, Dr. Eicher, for everything. I thank you to include me to this discussion. And personally, thank you, Dr. Kathleen. It was amazing. And a beautiful session for all of us. All right. And uh, the gentleman who started this show is also the founder and owner of Vita Support MD. They make vein formula 1000 and lymphatic formula 1000, which contains, by the way, MPFF, right, Dr. Chubak? Yes, that's absolutely correct. All of the products yeah. contain MPFF. And I just want to close by saying, again, wonderful, wonderful program. Thank you again, Monica, for inviting such an esteemed guest. Dr. Osvath, thank you for joining us. I know how hard you work and how um, limited your time is, but again, how committed you are to education. And this program is all about education. So I would ask that all of our listeners who enjoy the program, and I know that there are now, it seems, tens of thousands. We're getting more and more emails all the time from people who've never missed an episode and so forth. Please share the the program with your friends, anyone that you think might have a vascular problem, anyone that you know has swelling in their legs, anyone that you know who may be suffering from a wound that doesn't heal. Spread the word. There's a lot of good information here. We're learning each and every episode, and I'm sure that you can, and hopefully we can touch some lives and, and help some, some people. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Chubak. Uh, Dr. John A. Chubak, physician surgeon from New Jersey. I wanted to get all that in. You've been uh, listening and watching LymphCast episode 37. We'll see you next time for episode 38. Have a great day. 